All right, we are continuing with our exercise two, making our own custom emoji out of vector shapes. It's our introduction to the concepts of vectors, even though we're not gonna be using vector editing software for it. I'm gonna to go to our class, here we are, and then I'm gonna skip right to it by not going to unit modules, but going right to assignments. Because we've already introduced the unit module, we saw the past examples and everything, now I just want to get to where we post it. So post exercise two here. So assignments is a shortcut for that. I scroll all the way down. I can see where we post and we've got lots posted. Now there's two kind of requirements for this one. So I'm going to demonstrate. I haven't posted one yet. So I'm going to put my name. And the first thing you can all start a post with now because today's the deadline is your screen grab sketch, right? The one we made from emojimaker.me. This is to show kind of your inspiration. And these are construction sounds that are happening that kind of freaked us out in the morning, but now we're used to them. You get like a free foot massage. So I can post that and then I hit reply and I've got one component, right? Now I've got to make it with my own shapes. So I go to my folder, my class folder. I open up my exercise two, and you want to keep this organized. And I've added a few things over the weekend. So I had started a PSD, which starts to build shapes on top of this. And that's where we're going to pick it up from. What do I open up the PSD in? I don't double click it because that will open it up in Photoshop. I'm using freeware, we're the free section. You can see the link in the directions here, photop.com. We could also just type in photop.com. I'm not even logging in. I'm just using the free resource as long as it's free. And I'm just gonna drag the PSD in. Why the PSD? Because it has the layers and it's sized to our print requirements. What are our print requirements? What size does it need to be? Eight by 10 physical inches by how many pixels per inch? 300. By minimum of 300. So yes, so mine is 10 inches by 10 inches because very often emojis are designed in a square, just like typefaces. You don't want them too tall or too wide or you can't use them as easily, right? And so I did 10 by 10 inches by 300 pixels per inch. We're good. I have my little screen grab here, but I'm inspired by my favorite children's book and I wasn't able to get that guy to look the way I wanted with the screen grab from the website. This is the guy. So I went and found an image of it online. Actually, I just took a photo of it from my shelf. And then I did some sketches, like how to simplify that as an emoji. And I kind of liked this one. I think I did this one first, but I like this one. Now, here's the tricky thing. Vectors are shapes. They are not lines. You want to think of it as cut out paper. When we draw, we tend to draw with lines. We use lines to represent shapes, right? So what I want to do is maybe create it like this, but I'm using shapes just like this does to fill it in. Don't worry about the outlines around the shapes, worry about the cutouts of the shapes. If I gave you a stack of colored paper and I gave you scissors, that's how vectors are. So if I wanna make the nose, I'm not making the curved line around the nose, I'm making that big oval shape of the nose. And I'll show you then how we can put an outline around it, but we start with just a simple vector shape. So if I have these inspirations, I'm just gonna take my favorite inspirations, and maybe I put those to canvas as well. These are optional, but if you're really trying to, to do something specific with your emoji, it can help. So I have my required sketch, you know, this guy, but then I'm going to edit it with my more specialized reference from my children's book. And I'll label this, you know, optional inspirational reference images and whether you get them from your own camera whether you get them from a book a comic someone else's digital art 
or whether you sketch it yourself, this is all just to, to help guide what we create digitally. So I'm not using these pixels in my artwork like we did with the line art jumble. This is just gonna push me in the right direction. It doesn't matter if they're blurry because of that. It doesn't matter if they're high resolution. Even though my photographs are, they're just blurry photographs. So it's very low light. So you're always encouraged to, to post you know, other images that help remind you what you're trying to do with a project more and more, especially if you really have something you want to do with that project. All right, so this is what I'm thinking, but I'm going to start with this as my example. So I go to Photopea and it's in there. What did I do? I used the shape tool. Exercise one had the limitation you can only use black line art. You had to use five or more and you couldn't create any of your own marks, right? You had to edit, erase, warp from existing black line art. This has similar limitations. You can only use these vector shape tools, the rectangle, the ellipse, the parametric shape, and the custom shape. If you want a triangle, you're gonna do a parametric shape and then you'll say three corners, right? You're not gonna use the line tool because the line tool gives you an open path and an open path as a fill, you're always going to have to, it's just, we're not using it yet. We're going to learn that way better with vector programs later. So the rectangle, the ellipse, the parametric shape, the custom shape. You start with the biggest shape you can. So the biggest shape I see here is going to be a big circle. So I hold down shift with the ellipse tool and I can get a perfect circle. Because I'm using the vector shapes, none of these tools are useful or apply. Instead, we're only ever going to use this shape and then one or this tool and then one other tool, which is at the very top, the move tool. You want to set your move tool for auto select for layer. That way you can just click on your shape and it will select it so that you can move it. Because you're going to be moving these shapes just like you would cutouts of paper. And you want it to have transform controls turned off. Even though it seems like that's a good idea, they're going to be confusing to you because <laughs> you want to transform, which is to warp it, to squish it, to scale it, to rotate it. You want to know when you're transforming and when you're not, right? So these are the settings I recommend for the, the move tool. And then these are the tools you can use. Rectangle, ellipse, parametric shape, custom shape. When you make a new shape, how do you change the color? You don't use your lasso. You don't use adjustments. All of that's for pixels. Instead, you double click on the, the vector shape layer preview window. And that will bring up the properties for the, the fill color. You can see that because it's a vector, it's got a fill and it's got a stroke. We're using all empty strokes. So that should be a red X. You don't want an automatic outline around all of your shapes. If you had that, like a black outline around your shapes, then when you layer up shapes, they would each have a black outline around them. And that's not what you want. So instead, the fill color, the default is black. I want this to be a yellow. I can click on the yellow here and then pick a yellow. Or I can just click somewhere on the image and steal that color. Right? And if I want a skin tone, maybe, I think that's what I did before. Kind of this pasty, it's a British book. Pasty white professor, something like that. So... What's the difference between that shape that I just made now, that's a perfect circle, and this shape? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's a little warped. It's a little customized. So how do I get that shape? I take my perfect circle, if I want that kind of shape, and you see when you hover over a layer, it will show you the, the path as blue, which can be distracting, but you just click on a different layer in order to get rid of that. So what do I do? I warp it just like you did with your line art. So I, I do what's called free transform. I say, I click on the layer. I say, edit free transform. You're going to be doing this so much that you might as well learn the shortcut in Photo P for this, which is option command T. Okay. On your, on your max option command T. So when you get that, then you can use that to scale it. You can use shift 
to squeeze it. And if you want to do kind of the stranger shapes, you can right click in it and you can do things like skew. Skew will shift it from one edge. Not doing too much. <laughs> Option Command T. I don't use skew all that much. Distort's pretty helpful because it will shift it from corners. You know, stretch it in predictable ways that aren't quite as radical as warp. And then the radical one, Option Command T, is to right click and warp. This is where you can make it kind of lopsided a little more interesting, right? Now, I'm going to have my little sketch just open on the side here. The original guy there. Just so I can kind of reference it as I go. And I think I actually do want a perfect circle. So I can do Command Z back to when it's a perfect circle. And I want that perfect circle to be really dark. Maybe not black, but let's do like a dark brown. Like that. So now the problem is, how do I see where the eyes are, where the nose is, all the stuff I want, if I have this big shape covering it all? I can move it down, but then it gets completely covered up. So this is the technique that's it's often used that I like. We're going to use it for various things. We're going to use this as our guiding sketch. We're going to do what's called onion skinning it in illustration. So we make a duplicate of it. So I'm going to select this layer. Watch what happens when I hit Command J. Just something we're going to learn. Nothing happens to the image, but a new perfect duplicate layer was created that floats on top. And I'm going to move that layer above my shapes. And now I'm going to take the opacity down on that top duplicate to about 30%. And then I'm going to click on the padlock to lock it. This is like having a piece of tracing paper with your sketch on it uh, that you can flap on top of all the, the cutout shapes you're making. So now when I put the shapes in, I can see what they are, right? And I can see, yeah, that's about the right circle I want, but I can now build an eye on top of it. So I want the eye to be a perfect circle. So what do I do? I can go to the ellipse tool, hold down shift, kind of put it in place. There we go. Use, bless you, use the move tool to move it into place. And then I can do option command T or edit free transform. That's the shortcut for it. Hold down shift, make it the size I want because I'm going for a perfect circle here. And how do I change its color? Because right now it's black or it's dark brown, just like my last one. I want to change it to white. So I double click. I'm going to go into the upper left hand corner. That's just where white is on the color selector. Far upper left hand corner. Upper, yeah, upper left. So I've got my white shape. I've got my black shape. If I turn off my raster layers, those are my two vector shapes so far. These help guide me, right? So my next shape, what do I want? Let's get that nose. That nose is really prominent here. So I'm going to use the ellipse tool. This is what makes it look like a Muppet. And I can make it this way, just a long ellipse that's that white color. And then I can change it to be that kind of putty skin color. Something like this. When it comes to flat graphics, colors really matter. But as we're just getting introduced to it, we can kind of take our time. Now that nose is a very different shape than the one here, which is really just flat on the sides, right? So I can do a few things. I can try to Option Command T and warp this, distort it, tug it out at this side to kind of flatten it at the sides. And warp's going to be my best bet. But warp isn't great at getting back to straights. So I can try. Actually, it worked pretty well. <laughs> But I could also start with a rectangle and then just try to curve the one side of the rectangle. 